welcome to Raconteurs News. Good evening and welcome to this special Brexit edition of Raconteurs News. I'm Andy Young and as ever I'm joined by Jason. Good evening Jason. Good evening Andy my friend and uh, uh, what a what a day it's been, what a momentous day it's been. I mean I've only just this morning found out that uh, that uh, we've 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 voted to leave the EU. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm my opinion's a bit um, on the fence at the minute because I th- I think there must be something lined up for us. But um, the reason we're doing this show is um, well, actually, I don't know if you're aware. We uh, I don't think I told you we got a request after the show on. Uh, Wednesday that we did with Paul from Susie Q in the chat room asking if we could do a Brexit special and then as soon as I turned my PC on this morning Paul said well we've got some information I'd like to share so do you fancy doing an hour special so here we are welcome back Paul good evening hey, Paul. John. hi yeah it's been yeah we thought it was you know a bit of a low-key event so we ought to have a bit of a chat about it <laughs> yeah, it has been a little bit low key. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, can you tell us what we what were your first reactions when you heard the news? Well, obviously, I, I put up a post last night which basically said, "Look, the markets are moving a certain way." It all pointed to the fact that you know, Remain was going to win. I kind of said it's probably going to be fifty five forty five in favour of Remain. And, uh, it looks like some gigantic piece of theatre. And then, of course, yeah, we kind of, I didn't bother staying up for the results. There was no point. It seemed pretty much a foregone conclusion. And I kind of, as I said to you, I was having this dream about the gold price being up $80. Woke up, must have been about half past five, and checked on my phone and found, well, obviously at that point, I think the DAX was down about 800 points and gold was up 80. And I thought, uh oh, something's happened that I wasn't expecting. And yeah, I didn't expect. Um, Brexit to, to achieve the, you know, the goal of leaving the European Union by by a margin of 4%. But I think there's one point I'd like to make, because a lot of people were saying, oh, well, it's going to be a cabal stitch up, you know, it's going to be a remain vote, business as usual, nothing's changed, it's just the cabal doing what the cabal do. And then, in the next breath, now it's, oh no, the cabal engineered the vote for Brexit, because it suits them, because they make a killing on the stock market, or you know they're engineering something for the you know to, to bring down the European Union. Or they're doing you know you can't have it both ways. Absolutely not in the cabal's interest to mm-hmm. just, to you know begin unraveling the European Union. This is what Britain leaving the EU is is certainly going to do. And we've already heard today Holland want a referendum, Italy want referendum, France does. You mentioned before we came on the Czech Republic does no doubt Hungary will in due course and it will spread across Europe but no doubt Spain will will likewise probably follow so this is this set to a precedent the cabal don't want to uh, to have in place and what I have heard was subsequently because I actually had a chat with someone what it appears is is there was no seemingly no desire to uh, stop Brexit happening because the UK effectively is shifting to the Russia-China camp now. People may not believe that, but that's what I was told. Apparently all the trade contracts with the EU will be renegotiated. The UK simply is will not pay for Merkel's stupidity over the refugee crisis and also doesn't want to get involved in Turkey getting a free passage through the EU with these supposed uh, talks happening at the end of uh, June, which no doubt they'll try and fast track Turkey's uh, membership of the European Union. Incidentally, also, the Germans are silently really pleased that this has happened. Not, obviously, from Merkel's perspective, but from the German industrialists and commerce, etc. Now, another thing that's likely to happen, we'll see in due course, is the US banks are going to be shut out of the EU. So, basically, Goldman Sachs hold on the, on the EU will be next to nothing going forward which is going to be hugely beneficial to the European Union. But what I think this vote was, and Anthony Kerr want to say this, because I, 
I'm not a nationalistic person. I don't like the connotation of what that means. But clearly, this was a strong vote for nationalism in inverted commas and a no to globalism. And of course, globalism is the big US centric cabal ideology, which is hence why they formed the European Union in the first place, as we discussed on the, the last show. So, this is a big blow to the cabal because it wants to control the EU remotely, as, as we know, by our unelected technocrats. Uh, so, it, it is a hugely damaging exercise for them, and certainly not something that they were engineered because they can make a quick killing on the stock market. What? With worthless dollars, how does that benefit them? Well, it doesn't benefit. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I was watching the coverage of it on RT because I don't particularly uh, enjoy watching any TV news. And I, I have noticed of late when I occasionally click on RT because it's something I want to follow, it's becoming more and more like the BBC. They seem to be following the same sort of rhetoric. And they seem to be doing quite a bit of fear mongering. And there was an absolutely classy display of, of that last night when they were interviewing Lembit Opic and some guy who I've never heard of. And they got this American talking head guy on and he came out with the phrase, well, the reason that, that Trump is encouraging the Brexit is because when there's blood on the streets, there's money to be made. I thought, oh, here we go. And then, then I saw it turn to kind of 52% for Remain, and I thought, oh, the fix is in. I'm going to bed. I can't be bothered with this. But I got up this morning to quite a surprise, a pleasantly surprised. Well, yeah, I, well, I, and that's the point. I think this idea that the cabal, I mean, you know, people are saying, well, the cabal could rig it and ask it to me, well, there's electronic voting. Well, we don't. We have paper votes in the UK. And, you know, it was a what? A 1.3 million roughly votes in, in favour of leave. Well, if you get a, a sensible swing, you're talking about a 2 million vote swing. You just can't rig, them, rig an election that easily with that many votes in this type of thing. It's not like we're having a general election with different parties right? with, you know, sometimes you get six, seven, eight, ten candidates per, you know, per mm. election. So it's, an, it's a simple, straightforward yes or no, effectively, or remain or leave. So that was never really for me a, a, an obvious um, chance that they could have rigged it to that in that way. I mean, but I, the indication was, yeah, for sure, that remain was going to win and it would be quite substantial. And that's why I thought, well, yeah, it looks like it's going to deal. be quite a resounding victory, but that's based on the fact that the market's got pumped up hugely. And, of course, the question then remains, well, why was it pumped up so strongly? That's not something that normally happens. The cabal think they're going to lose. Now, some people will say, well, maybe they got out and then went massively short. They're not going to take that risk. They, they don't make risky trades unless they know they're absolutely certain of the outcome. And of course, clearly they would. They thought they were certain the outcome, and then the outcome was quite the contrary. But another side issue, of course, in all this is that if you think this is all about the cabal engineering some sort of crisis, well, ironically, you know, your Russia and China benefit very strongly by the fact that Brexit happened. China, yeah. in particular, they'll now sell, dump all their dollars or treasuries, and they'll buy a UK asset probably very likely from U.S. and U.K. banks. And who's going to buy up all the U.S. dollars in the Treasury? The Bank of England to support the pound, which is why we heard today the Bank of England are going to put in $250 billion. Do we read that? Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. So that's, again, what China benefits from this. So if you think it's the Western cabal trying to do themselves a favor, well, they're actually helping China and Russia in the process. But I think I think if, when people when people start um, sort of suggesting that uh, that it's the cabal that have engineered this, I think they're underestimating the power that we've that we've had. I mean, there's there's thousands and thousands of little shows like this, um, and all talking to only a small amount of people, but it, it's it's still uh, collectively it's a large amount of people, and I think people with this referendum actually really knew uh, what was going on. Oh, I do agree. And also, you know, we have the simple little thing about filling it in with a pencil or filling it filling it in with a pen. And 
there was people kind of what I call cabal apologists foaming at the mouth about people making an issue of this, but it became a big issue and a lot of people took their own pens along and said, No, I'm filling this in, you know, I'm voting with a pen and not I'm not gonna use the pencil that you provided and so you know, these may be nitpicking and, you know, a bit people say a bit conspiratorial, but the point of fact is it's part of that awakening process and a, a lack of trust in an electoral system and also the whole political system full stop. So yeah, I do think that Whilst people are still not really aware of the specifics of, uh, you know, who's responsible exactly, I think there is becoming an increasing awareness that the entire political system is utterly flawed, utterly corrupt. But you just haven't joined the dots as to who's actually responsible. And in some senses, that doesn't matter. Because on a certain level, once people have this awareness, it is going to change people's voting habits mm-hmm. and voting patterns. And we, I think we saw that clearly yesterday. Yeah, I, I saw something interesting as I was having a little look through Facebook this morning when I realised what had happened. And it was actually a post from uh, Tony Moran, who was on with us on Tuesday night. And he was saying how pleased he was that the, the people of this country had took back their power and we now got an opportunity to rebuild the country. And I said, yeah, I think you're right to to a point, Tony, but I think we've got no chance of actually rebuilding this country whilst we've got the political parties involved because they're, they're just, uh, they're controlled um, completely and no one who represents a political party can actually represent the views and needs of their constituents because of the, the whipping system. So as far as I'm concerned, anyone who belongs to a political party should be banned from seeking any public office and political parties should be lobbying lobbying groups, which is what they actually are, but disbarred from holding power. Sorry, disbarred from serving the public. We need need to get away from this idea of being in power because they're not there to be in power. They're there to serve us. Oh, agreed, ultimately, but I think we come back to this point, which I've said before, that we have the old paradigm, which is where we are now. We have a new paradigm, but we're going to have to have some sort of bridge between the two. Otherwise, we risk complete implosion. So we're going to have to have some interim kind of governance, for want of a better word, that allows us to transition between the two phases. And it's going to be interesting, of course, because Cameron obviously resigned unsurprisingly. Now, who's going to replace him? I mean, Oh, an obvious choice is Boris Johnson, but then he'll have to be re-elected as an MP, but it's a possibility, and there's a lot of speculation as was he just playing a game to you know, to get back in office and become Prime Minister. Well, it was a pretty high-stakes game for him to play because he could have lost the, the lead vote and he would have been in the political wilderness. So I, I suspect not that that's the case, but who knows. But, but you're absolutely right. In the long term, there'll be a different... Um, solution in place and there has to be but at the end of the day it's once again it's not the political system that's wrong it's the lunatic who enforce this political system not to work for, for the benefits of humanity so we need to get the balance right in that respect but mm. for sure it, I mean is this going to have some radical change in the political system in the UK well who knows I mean the, the answer will really come as to who's the next Prime Minister and what do they start doing and how do they how do they you know, differ or not differ from the political system we've had you know, basically all our lives and, and well beyond that. So that will be an interesting thing. And I think what will actually be pretty interesting from a UK perspective, because I actually think the whole Brexit thing is, is largely an exercise in US isolation in terms of the cabal. And we're seeing a lot of evidence globally that everyone's isolated in the US as well. Now, that doesn't mean that other cabal are going to survive and be strong. I think they're backing away. They have less information to want to be part of it. And if, as it was said to me, that the UK is rotating to Russia and China, then what will be really interesting is when the UK start, do they start to use the Renimbi and not the, you know, US swaps? That'll be a clear indication the US has turned east and the Renimbi has displaced the US dollar as, you know, the kind of key, key global credit provider. Now, people say, oh, hang on, that's the same old financial system as we've had. It's the same old rubbish. Well, you're not going to phase these 
financial systems out overnight. Where yeah, we can sink them all and then spend 100 years trying to work out what we need to do in the meantime, everything's plunged into darkness. So we're going to have, we're going to be stuck with what we've got for a period of time. Yes, things will ultimately change, but I mean that that's something further down the line. But I think when the UK you know, has no need for US swaps anymore because China will provide all the US dollars they need while buying up their assets, that's something I think we'll start to see. And also, I think we'll start to see huge stress build up in the paper, physical gold and silver. Oh, sorry, the paper gold and silver markets, and we're actually apparently seeing huge buying going on again in London particularly today, which um, may in part count for why the gold prices has managed to stabilize and still be up pretty much $60 on the day, given you were expected to drop back. But I think the physical demand means as much as they want to play shenanigans in the paper market, they're failing to do so. Well, could that not be put down to uh, people trying to offset losses that they're going to lose in, in the pound, uh, the devaluation the, the of the pound? Um, it, by purchasing gold, even if it's paper gold, it, it's probably got a, bit, a better chance than, than a devalued pound. Well, the issue is, of course, was, you know, if as the price of if the price is denominated in dollars and we're devalued, you know, effectively the currency is devalued, but you know the, the dollar's strong against the pound, then naturally you're going to make money anyway, relatively. I mean, overnight the spot price of for example, went up about two dollars an ounce just on the currency swing, because obviously the pound went from what one dollar fifty, and I think it got as low as one dollar thirty. So there was that aspect to to the devaluation process within the currency, and yeah, but you know people will buy ETFs, but it's not the answer. You need to buy physical metal, and because ultimately the LBMA and the COMEX is going to disappear. And, and the Chinese model of if you buy an ounce of gold, it's backed by physical metal will prevail. So, as ever, I wouldn't advise people to, you know, to kind of take a, a chance on buying ETFs. I think you're likely to get wiped out. And as we've saw in the last 24 hours, there's an interesting, a lot of the, the trading houses for using derivatives all suspended stop losses. <laughs> so there's going to be quite a few people who got seriously burned. Um, overnight at some point or likely to got seriously burnt and it was kind of interesting they suspended the stop losses until I think it was 5pm UK time today very very puzzling why they chose to do that which may burst have some in, indication of what was what we do expect to happen but um, yeah don't touch paper markets something I thought was um, a bit of Perhaps it's something to be a bit wary of. We we got the absolutely wonderful announcement this morning that uh, Dave Scammeron has handed in his resignation. But I'm thinking he's still around till October. Um, you can do. I mean, the man has has done dreadful damage to this country already. Um, he can do an awful lot more between now and October. I mean, have have we got any safeguard against that? Well, he could, but be honest, I mean, what prime minister in this country has any power? Not. They don't do anything. They're just puppets. And the reason for October is there's the summer recess in Parliament. Oh, yeah. I see. So and that's... It, and, he's, a, he's a bit of a dead duck as well, isn't he? He's not going to get any backing for any of his ideas or anything. Oh, no. Well, no. He's but just he's a figurehead at the moment. Well, he's a figurehead for the last six years. He's not made any decisions. He's just there to... So he's like a glorified teleprompter rather like a farmer. He doesn't make decisions. And now he's gone, he's gone. I mean, he, you know, otherwise they could have just said, oh, just keep him hanging around. They've got rid of him because he deems to be a complete liability. So you'll be lucky if you hear him speak again. I think he'll just disappear and never to be heard from, you know, or maybe two, three, well, given that it's going to change, probably not. But in the old day, he would have disappeared for a few years and then they brought him back in some capacity and hoped everyone forgot what happened. So, no, I don't, I don't see that as a particular issue. I think it's quite indicative of the reality of the situation that if he's gone so quickly, I think they, they realised his position was untenable. Now, what happens to the remainder of the cabinet, such as Osborne, is an interesting uh, question, because I don't think his position is tenable either. No. But time to tell what happens. 
Well, on the on the subject of Osborne, um, something that I'd, I'd really like your view on, Paul, is ever since um, Osborne, Cameron came to power, uh, they have, in a, in a way worse way than I've ever seen before, demonised those less fortunate in in our society. And the you know austerity is all the fault of people who are scrounging off the dole, or people who are sick and can't work, or immigrants come in here, and uh, we've all got to pay for that, and we've all got to suffer and tighten our belts. Do you, do you think this false austerity is now actually dead in the water, and they'll start to backtrack, or do you think it will carry on for a while? Well, first of all, let's hope. I hope it does stop because you're absolutely right. It's an abomination that they, what has gone in the six years of, well, as the coalition government, the last 12 months as the government in their own right. I mean, that's that's a very good question. I mean, will, I mean, there's an argument. Some are saying, well, we may end up having another election because come the autumn. I'm not so sure that'll happen, but it's a possibility. But I mean, the acid test in all this is, do we see a change of policy in the government? which would give us a clear indication of the, the, the kind of cabal influence or the influence that's holding sway over government policy currently comes to an end. So I think until we get a new government, well, a new prime minister, and is that prime minister going to be a genuine prime minister rather than a fake one, then um, time will tell on that score. But naturally we hope to see an end to it because we've all heard horror stories and some first hand and some second and third hand and you know they're endless how they've treated I mean how they've treated people you know if you've gone back in history and recalled what they've done to people in this country people would go I can't believe that could have happened in peacetime never mind in wartime um, so it, you know it is incredulous that this has been allowed to happen and I think and I think that's kind of also is incredulous is the people who said we should remain in the European Union and almost defending it like it, like it's kind of something that's been so good for Europe and so good for European people without realising it is an absolute dictatorship that has wrecked nations. The people say, oh, well, Greece was economically you know, naive or just wasted money and profligate in terms of its behaviour and activity and other nations such as that. But they don't realise the backstory of how they were forced to go into the European Union. They were given all this credit, literally forced upon them, made to spend it by, the, and then were just destroyed when it came to having to repay the debt, which they could never manage. And if that's what people think is a great model for Europe, and we have huge unemployment in the pigs nations, and youth unemployment is absolutely ridiculous. It's like 50% in half of these nations. I mean, it's kind of in, impossible for anybody outside the European Union to, to necessarily believe what they've done to nations. And these people who wanted to stay in were trying to eulogise that somehow the European Union is this nice, cuddly, friendly organisation who has the best interests of European people and nations. And, and the, pe possible. the people that have been, uh, the, the Remain people that have been defending it, they've all almost been portraying Europe as a victim. That, that we This is something that we've done to Europe you know and, and it's almost portrayed as as it, th that Europe is the victim in this whereas you know that's obviously not the case it's 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 perception management well yeah and I've seen some celebrities going on about they're ashamed of this their nation for voting in such a way and it's a travesty and we've destroyed the future for our children and when and the point is that yes a lot of the you know, under 25s, I think it was 70% they claim. I, mean, I have to use the word claim because how do they know precisely? But okay, let's work on the basis that they claim that 70% wanted to remain in the European Union. But the question I would have, and no disrespect to anybody who's under 25, is what frame of reference do they know what it's like not to live within the confines of the European Union? They've never had any experience of what it used to be like outside the European Union. So, I think a lot of them want to stay in the European Union because they fear, oh, it'll be the end of you know, our ability to go and live in these countries and go work there. 
and it's going to affect us economically. Well, here's the point. They're not going to stop people from the European nations coming to live in Britain or vice versa, because you know, if I'd have wanted to go in the 80s or the early 90s and live in European nations, you could just go and live there. There was no imposition to stop you going. I mean, what are the real benefits for, for the average person? In the European Union, well, if you live inside the Eurozone, except the UK, you can go, you know, you can use your currency in all those nations. And you can travel between nations without showing your passport when you cross the border. Well, apart from that, what are the other great benefits? There is not. Well, can, if, I can just, not benefit. if I can just pick you up on that, uh, Paul, um, I lived in Spain for a couple of years myself. Um, I've got a couple of friends who are out there at the moment, um, Ken and Susie. And um, we're told that it's without borders and we can travel without a passport, but that, that really isn't the case because if you go and live in Spain, uh, firstly, if you take your motor vehicle over there, you need to um, change it over to Spanish plates, which will cost you over a thousand pounds. And secondly, you need to carry and be able to produce your passport at all times. So uh, that is a complete, complete. Well, that's, I mean, what I meant is like the, when we used to drive, it's when we were going through France, Belgium, Holland, mm -hmm. you just drive over the border and then no one stops you, no one sees your passport. But you're absolutely right. Yeah. Technically, if you travel around the European Union, you should either have an ID card, you know, like a European ID card, or you need to have your passport. And otherwise, in, in, in principle, you could be in a bit of hot water and want. I don't, we don't know what exactly what happened. Lisa and I were on a train going from, through Germany back into Holland. And something happened. We're not exactly sure. And these kind of plain clothes, somebody, police or otherwise, got on and wanted to see people's ID. Now, fortunately, I had my passport with me. If I had, I might have had a few problems. Because the immediate question would be, well, who the hell are you and where did you come from? So, yeah, exactly. There are other aspects of that. But I mean, I was using it rather flippantly, trying to find some tenuous justification for why people think the EU um, has some justification. And really, frankly, apart from the benefit of being able to travel around most of Europe with euros and spend your euros, there's no other real benefit. That, and yet, everyone's eulogising that somehow this European experiment is so good. And then it's the, oh, well, we won't be able to trade with Europe anymore. Well, of course we will. And... Because the European Union is not going to want us to stop trading with them. It's a reciprocal relationship. It's not, well, if Britain pulls out, it's the end of the UK. But, well, the European Union is going to be fine with this arrangement. Well, of course they're not. And the other thing is, of course, that Britain can renegotiate trade agreements with every other nation on, on this planet, which is going to be hugely beneficial to them. And then, of course, one of my favourite subjects in all this, of course, is the agricultural industry. Without all those... EU caps and, and restrictions on our ability to farm our own land, we're going to have a thriving agricultural industry. That will create a huge amount of jobs, not just in terms of production. You've got logistics, transport, the, the wholesalers, you know, farmers type markets, people selling produce. This will generate huge amounts of jobs. So there's also that flip side of the fact of what additional jobs can we now create outside the European Union. And we have far more flexibility. And if we indeed are rotating to Russia and China, then we can start to have better trading relationships with those nations and other BRICS nations. And it will allow us to become economically far, or potentially economically far stronger than we are now. Uh, not that I'm advocating everything about being economically stronger than everybody else, but the point is, it's not a weakness to be out of the European Union. And I think it comes back to the point People have been kind of almost brainwashed into believing that the European Union is the most important, you know, organisation, and we all have to be part of it. If we're not, we're doomed to failure. Well, just ask Norway. Norway doesn't have any problems. And if people think everyone's going to get kicked out of all the European nations, well, we're all still part of the EEA. And actually, Switzerland's not part of the EEA or the EU, but Swiss people can all come and live in this country and vice versa. And there's no problem. You can go and live in Norway. They're only part of the EEA. No one has a problem. So this is all fear. It's all trying to terrify people into imagining that if you're not in the European Union, 
you've got a big problem. But I think increasingly people are realising there are no benefits really to any of nations. And also all of the fear is just exactly that, just fear mongering to scare people into, into believing that you know, if you're not part of the European Union, you're in the dark age. Yeah, um, I, one question I wanted to ask you. Do you think that be, now we're quite a large break in this in this um, this wall that is the European Union? Um, now we've been removed from that now, um, and I noticed uh, it came to my attention anyway that on Sunday there's a general election in Spain. Now, do you think that this is perhaps the beginning of the fall of the European Union? on a, a, a larger and, and quicker scale because we all know how uh, how the um, uh, the Spanish are, are quite fickle when it comes to to, uh, to voting as, as um, witnessed after the 2003 Madrid bombings that uh, that completely changed the votes uh, totally so I'm just wondering what sort of effect that might have in Spain and uh, do you, if you think that that we're going to see the end of the EU, sooner rather than later, because I think everybody's agreed that it, it's going to go. Yeah, well, I, I kind of said uh, today to someone that I see Brexit as the Archduke Ferdinand moment of the European Union. It's kind of, it's going to be the catalyst of that we'll see the end of it. Now, obviously, will, will it have that big an effect on the Spanish elections? Very difficult. It's not a lot of time. I mean, we don't know. I, I don't profess to know and you know, Andy might be able to help me out better here with what goes on in Spain. Um, I, it may have an effect on the election, but I think it may certainly see the, the Catalan people demanding more and more some kind of uh, autonomy in their region. I think that may, we may see that sort of effect in the coming weeks and months, how it will affect the Spanish election. The argument is, well, who's actually standing for election in Spain? And is there anyone there who may have a you know, an opposing viewpoint that may actually ben may benefit the Spanish people as opposed to the usual kind of puppet politicians who are just there to do as they're told. I mean, that that will be interesting to see what the outcome is. It, it may we may get some indication of a swing in people's you know, viewpoints in that nation, but certainly I do think it's a catalyst for the end. And uh, but of course, it's going to end economically anyway. At some point, it will implode. This may, you know, in some ways actually help to galvanise the European nations to to leave the European Union, but to do it in a way that's more far more beneficial. Because the other thing, of course, is Britain's not just walking out of the European Union today. It will have to go through a kind of process of reorganisation. It will have to sort trade agreements out of the European Union. We're talking probably by the time they implement Clause 50, which is the mechanism for leaving the European Union, and a kind of due diligence debriefing process. You're talking probably from now two and a half years till that's completed. And people say, oh, so you're telling me the cabal are still going to be around for two and a half years. No, I'm not saying that. That's a process. But, you know, if the cabal can go in a way that we can, you know, take down the European Union in a sensible manner and nations are able to leave and we're able to do it in a, in a far more seamless manner, that's far more beneficial. It doesn't mean the cabal have to be around for the next two years for that to happen. It could be gone next week and we can still do this process sensibly. And that is a far better way than just having this notion of, well, let's firebomb everything and, and then take the consequences later. I'd rather see a far more managed approach to the soft landing world than the hard landing. Mm. On, the, on the subject to, well, firstly, the Spanish elections. Um, I'm not entirely sure how this will influence them, but I think it will have a big influence and will possibly galvanise uh, many into perhaps a better turnout than possibly would have been before. But I was over there uh, at the time of the Madrid train bombings and uh, around the same time, I believe from memory, it was just shortly afterwards, there were 17 uh, Spanish special special forces soldiers were killed in Afghanistan, I think it was. And um, when those bodies came back, uh, there was an immediate election and uh, I think it was Afnar got the boot uh, or, or Afnar got in. You know, but they, they immediately threw the government out in favour of uh, the party that said, we'll bring all the Spanish soldiers home. 
Um, so it, it was, you know, the, the Spanish people are perhaps, from what I saw when I was there, more political than your average Joe Soap who, you know, re- reads The Sun and, and watches EastEnders and so on. What, what can I do about it? And shrugs their shoulders. So I, I think that could be quite an encouraging way to go forward. Um, there was something else I was going to mention in there. but Oh, yes. Yeah, I'm just looking at a headline now. And uh, it's from my kind of mainstream source, which is RT. And the headline is, Now Get Out, in inverted commas. Start Clause 50 exit process now in capitals. EU chiefs urge the UK. It says that EU chiefs want to be rid of Britain as soon as possible if a statement from the European Council released in the wake of the UK's shock Brexit is anything to go by. Is that more fear-mongering, Paul? Well, they can say what they like, but it's not up to them when Britain starts Clause 50. I think it's better that Britain starts Clause 50 sooner rather than later, but they're just it's just to give the illusion to the rest of Europe, we're in charge, we're in control. Britain's Britain's just this kind of little puppet and does as it's told and we're just trying to flex our muscles and look like we're in charge. That's all it's just grand political theatre and frankly Britain will just laugh, look at them and go, Oh really? Are you quite sure about that? But I mean, at the end of the day, these people in the European Union have zero interest in the interest of Europe. They are there as puppets for the Bush, Langley controlling mechanism, which completely and utterly subjugates the European Union. They control it ultimately, which is why Merkel is, is completely acquiesced to everything Washington says. So it's just words and they can say what they like. And undoubtedly, they're just trying to convince other European nations, don't mess with us. And that's what this is about. They're terrified now. The Holland. And I think Holland actually might be the next nation that goes, we're having a referendum and, uh, because we're, you know, we're kind of sick to death of what you're doing to us as a nation. They had the referendum over Ukraine, which, of course, the Dutch government completely ignored. But they're going to have a hard job now. And, and already, I think, Russia today was trying to go, oh, no, there's no desire to have um, a referendum. And then a poll came out saying, well, actually, 53% of Dutch people want a referendum. <laughs> So, you know, it's just the usual uh, political grandstanding where they want to convince people that we're in charge, we're in control. Because, of course, ultimately, when nations lose their fear, then it's the end. And that's what this is all about. Everything's about fear. And actually, this is this will quite interest you because I think one point that was worth getting on to is we know the US cabal have had a serious bloody nose today. And they'll be furious about what the consequences are because they'll see that their grand experiment which failed in the Second World War is on the verge of collapsing again. And here's an interesting statement that's come out from the US State Department. It says, we are alerting US citizens to the risk of potential terrorist attacks throughout Europe targeting major events, tourist sites, restaurants, commercial centers and transportation. Travel warnings are issued when the State Department wants you to consider very carefully whether you should go to a country at all. Well, that kind of suggests that the US cabal are so angry and so furious about what's happened today that they are going to probably instigate or try to instigate some false flags around Europe. Well, apart from the fact we hope they don't for obvious reasons, what they actually fail to realise is it will just accelerate the demise of the European Union, it will further alienate the US as a nation, which has already been isolated globally through the dumping of dollars, through trade agreements, through from what seems to be that the UK is turning its back on the special relationship and in inverted commas that it never has ever had with the US, or well, not for, for a long time anyway. And all they're going to do is accelerate their own demise and Ultimately, this will have a serious backlash on the U.S. people as a nation when seemingly increasingly the U.S. refuses or their administration stroke cabal stroke Bush's stroke Rockefeller's refuse to, to back down and acquiesce on, in respect of anything. And that kind of threatening overtures made by 
the US State Department suggests we may be in for some potentially serious problems in the coming weeks and months. Mm -hmm. And Paul, if I can just butt in there, um, there's one thing that I do need to to let people know about, as uh, I might forget if we're at the end and we get rushed for time. Um, when we finished at you know, just out, just under 20 minutes, uh, we'll be doing a test on our new broadcasting system. So we'll have uh, Ken, the genial Geordie, uh, over there in the north of Spain in the beautiful mountains. He'll be... Uh, get, get, get rid of him from Spain, he's an immigrant. <laughs> we'll be, we'll be uh, having some great... Uh, tunes from Ken, um, and I think there, there'll be some rock in there. There always is. There'll be all kinds of stuff. Ken's got a, a wonderful taste in music, as well as being able to play the guitar like a, uh, well, a, a demon, really. Uh, well, angel, possibly. I don't know. Um, and then uh, we'll have the Cockney Winker with, well, who knows what. Um, I know Tony's he's got quite a a bit lined up tonight he's got his playlist all ready um and really looking forward to it there'll be uh, always a great variety of tunes most of which you've never heard before from tony but um shortly after the show uh, the the raconteur's new spreaker player will disappear from above the chat room and there will be a small radio player there so uh, when we finished and gone off air uh, Tony will be updating the website, so if you could just refresh the page a time or two until you see the new player above there, and uh, I'm not sure whether it will start automatically, you might need to click the play button, which is the small triangle pointing to the right, and uh, you'll be away, and um, from what I've heard already on the beta testing we've done, the sound coming out of that player will absolutely blow your mind. So make sure you've got your best surround sound speakers plugged in. And uh, it, it should be a great evening because I think we've got music lined up all the way from 8 p.m. to 2 in the morning. So um, good way to, well, it's the only way to chill out on a Friday night. I know I love it. Absolute. Once we've uh, finished for the week, get your feet up Friday night, listen to Ken and... Uh, Tony so anyway back to the show Paul yeah right yeah well it'd be interesting well, to hear the sound quality then compared to to the previous shows but anyway I digress sorry I, I was just going to say I've just done a, a little bit of a thing from uh, Heath's just sent me a, um, a a message and he said that there's already talk of a second EU referendum in the in the mail. I, I, I'm assuming that's the Daily <laughs> Mail. And the petition has 100,000 signatures. I no, mean, this, this is just, you know, this is somebody putting... It, again, it's completely blown out of proportion. It is somebody got a petition together demanding a referendum. And if they get 100,000 signatures, technically Parliament's supposed to go, oh yeah, we'll consider well, what's Parliament going to do? Go, yeah, let's have a second referendum. And then and make this country look like an absolute laughing stock and a ridicule across the world. You know, it's not a second referendum. It's someone's idea because they because of sour grapes because they lost out and Remain didn't win. They're going, oh, let's let's get a petition together. Well, how many petitions have we seen signed by a hundred thousand people and the government's ever done anything about it? Mm, uh, probably not. So yeah. basically, it's just hot air. But I think one thing, rather than focusing on a second referendum. I think one thing we're going to see is we, we realise that Scotland voted in all the various sort of areas unanimously to remain. Now, we all know that Scotland voted for uh, independence and actually rejected it to stay in the Union. I think there's big political pressure to get Scotland to have another referendum. We're already hearing Sturgeon making such comments that Oh, we, we, we see another referendum because we voted to remain. So they want to remain in you know inside the EU and they think, well if we have another Scottish independence referendum, we'll get the necessary numbers to cede from the union. And then they think, Oh, I know a really intelligent thing to do. Let's apply to join the European Union. Well, the whole point is and what they actually failed to realize. Even if they do that, which frankly for me will be insane, 
they're going to have to go through the whole process where they can't just join the European Union overnight. They'd have to go through kind of like every other nation has to go through the whole due diligence process. Okay? I know some of that's a bit flawed in the past. They may be able to accelerate it and fudge it in some way, but they're not going to get in for a period of time, so they'll be stuck in no man's land for however long that happens against the backdrop of a European Union that's crumbling, decaying by the day. And I'm sorry to say, if you have any Scottish listeners, but if you want to go that way, fine, but you'll re- regret it seriously and realise this is pol- a p- purely a political move by the SNP. And it is not in- done for any Scottish person or you know, people or the nation's best interest. It's purely for a political motivation. And if they want to proceed with that, fine. I mean, the argument was the first time, why did the referendum vote fail? Well, there's an argument that would say, oh, hang on, um, they failed the first time, so there was a cause of it, well, perhaps it was rigged. Um, the issue is, well, if it was rigged the first time, then those who rigged it the first time will certainly try and rig it the second time because they won't want to break up the, the union. And, of course, what happens to the SNP if, you know, they fail in their objectives to try and seed from the union. It really leaves them in tatters. And the other thing is the Labour Party aren't exactly going to be thrilled about having the issue of um, a devolved Scotland or, you know, seeding from the union because the chance of them ever forming a government again is virtually nil. Seeing as they're largely dependent on Scottish votes to, to bump up the number of seats to get a majority. Yeah. And I, one thing I did notice, which I thought was quite telling, it was earlier on there was uh, pictures of Boris Johnson leaving his home this morning, and he was there was quite a few protesters outside his house. Um, and when he came out, he was being called names and he was being shouted at. You know, this was obviously after the the result had been announced. Um, and, and, but what I did notice is there were a load of coppers there. Now these police, these coppers, these you know these clowns in uniform. They were all dressed in the high visibility uh, coats and the traditional Bobby's helmet, you know. They, and 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 I thought to myself, if if the result had been the other way round and there'd be protesters outside David Cameron's house, the police would have been dressed in riot gear in the stormtrooper gear. And I just thought that was quite telling, you know. They they it's like they they, they know what sort of people what you know. It's middle class. Uh, they, these were middle class protesters because that, that that's really what's happened today is uh, people that are happy with the status quo or, uh, sorry with status quo or middle class they suddenly realize that, that there's more people that are being victimized by the system and be and being impoverished uh, and and you know they, they could send the bobbies in the helmets and the and, and the high visibility coats because they knew that these were just middle class, angry middle Englanders that had, that had just come out. It's just, yeah, it, make, I just thought the make, contrast was interesting. Oh, yeah, of course. They're probably all they like to do is throw the little pot of couscous at him or something. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, actually, I've, I've added it. Someone's just sent me something which is quite interesting, and I'll keep it anonymous. But they said that. A, a relation of theirs works. His work just recently started working. So it's kind of one of those kind of uh, small, kind of, want a better word, kind of spread betting type, of, you know, companies that people can trade, you know, long, short, whatever they want to do. Uh-huh. And it's and apparently last night they said before the results came in for, for the, the vote, the, the company put this bet on on for themselves on Brexit happening today and, and cleaned up and made a huge amount of money. Now, <laughs> that is interesting. So why, what was kind of giving people the indication that Brexit was going to happen? <laughs> when it was clearly obvious that all day and pretty much for the few days before that, it wasn't now, it's entirely possible that somebody's man because they do, they, there's no doubt it's very likely somebody somewhere is going to have an indication throughout the day that despite all indications that it was going to be a remain vote that, that you know, Brexit was going to be, was going to happen. So that is entirely possible and 
it may be just an isolated incident, and it's quite possible that is indeed the case, but it's kind of interesting that somebody obviously got win um, before all the results came in after poll shut, that that was going to happen. But of course, it's entirely possible in this day and age of, uh, that you know, word can spread quite, quite quickly that a vote's going to go a certain way, despite all the indications to the contrary. Yeah, and I, I also um, I also thought that the the uh, the way that oh God, the the way the way that the voting went was from from my experience all all my experience was there was uh, everybody I spoke to wanted out. And the only time I really got any indication, inclination that anybody wanted to stay in was from the media, which shows how influential the media were in in in, in the uh, in 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 this race, and how public opinion has still won through. And I, I still believe it will probably a lot wider margin than, than we're being told. Well, I mean, it's possible. I mean, they. As I said, if the margin was narrow enough, then they may have been able to rig the vote. But I don't doubt. You know, let's say it was half a million votes or a quarter of a million votes. You know, one way or other, that narrow is possible. I mean, it might be, for argument's sake, that they actually did try and rig the vote. And in fact, they only managed to get the, the margin down to 1.3 million when it should have been 2, 3, 4 million. I still come back to the point, I think it's hard to, to rig millions of votes in, in a kind of you know, binary binary voting system like that, which is a yes or no essentially, if you as it happens, rather than a you know a conventional election. So who knows? It's it's possible. But what I do think they completely underestimated is the percentage of people who would turn out, which was seventy two percent, which is which is pretty high compared to elections in my living memory of never. I don't think we've had anything as high as seventy two percent. So it's kind of quite in, indicative that people were kind of felt, you know, passionate enough to, to go out and decide to. to yeah, vote, I think, uh, I think it was in the fifties, were it the last time we had uh, such a high turnout? Yeah, so that, that's about fifties. So we're talking post-war era. Um, so where, 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 where you know nationalistic nationalistic feelings would have been massively high. So yeah. But it, it's actually it's kind of interesting. I think we we can't kind of not talk about Putin's response to Brexit. Um, well, apparently, it's interesting, there was somebody trying, or some people trying to accuse Putin of influencing the vote in some, how, some way. I don't quite see how that am, but he's come out with this quote, which is quite interesting. He says, it seems to me understandable why Brexit happened. Firstly, no one wants to feed and subsidise weaker economies. Evidently, people are not happy with the resolution of security issues, which has sharply deteriorated on the back of strong flow of migrants, he continued. He said the vote to leave was a result of nothing other than arrogance and a superficial approach from the British leadership to issues that are vital to their country and to Europe as a whole. And, you know, whilst that there might be some elements of uh, it's just political rhetoric, the I think there is an element of truth now, but we have to be a little bit careful because as much as I wanted the European Union to end because it's of no benefit to anyone, and actually, yes, ironically, I did vote for the very first time in my life and voted for us to leave. Um, I'm very, very sort of reticent to be that I don't get lumped in with this whole immigrant issue and the idea of oh my God, we're getting flooded with, with migrants. I just don't, this, that whole argument is completely detrimental. It does nothing but damage the credibility of why we should leave um, the European Union. It does nothing to add to the argument, except just allows that issue, oh, well, this is all right-wing lunatics who want to, to leave. It isn't. There are people out there who, like myself, who have no issue or interest in this whole immigration aspect. i on the ending for, all, for a lot of other reasons as, as other people do. So we have to be a little bit careful, but I think what Putin said is true. I think there was an arrogance and a superficial approach, and they actually underestimated the fact that 
a lot of people in the country have started to wake up to the reality of what's going on and they decided enough was enough and wanted out. Yeah. It, 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 they, have been, they have been completely arrogant. Completely arrogant and... Um, People I've seen through it, it's it, it's it has put a, a little bit of a, it's restored a little bit of my faith in humanity that uh, that we've been able to pull this off uh, between us because it's been a collective effort. There's been lots and lots of different people in the mainstream and the, in the alternative media as well, but uh, in the end we've managed to pull it off, um, and I think this is probably a quite a big break in the uh, the wall that is the new world order, the EU, whatever you want to call it. Um, at the cabal, uh, I think this is I think this is a huge victory for us, and for us to just be looking for reasons that somebody's tried to engineer this for their own ends, I, I think is is perhaps counterproductive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, yeah, great. What I'd like to say it's it's been um, a rather unexpected, pleasant surprise today. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing how it goes in the future. Thank you so much for uh, coming on and doing this at such short notice, Paul. Uh, it's always good well, to... I, think I felt we had to talk at some... I mean, it, yeah, the debate will run and run and we'll see what unfolds in the in the coming weeks and months. So I think the, the stuff coming out of the US State Department, I don't, I'm not want to go right by the fear angle, but I think it's something that we need to be aware of and it's something that the alternative community needs to talk about because the more it's raised, the more people are aware of it, the less likely they are to, to hit major events and and all these other obscure locations they're referring to. I, I think, I mean, it might partly be fear, but I think it is um, a direct retribution for the fact that the US cabal have had a serious bloody nose there for, uh, over the whole Brexit issue. and. I wouldn't be surprised if they do focus their attention on the UK more than than across Europe. I think that across Europe is just a vague reference to try and not narrow it down too much. But um, I think we need to be a little bit careful of that and spread the word and get people to be aware that that is a, there is a risk of that without you know, being gripped too much by you know, living in fear of, of, of the fear of something. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for uh, for your insight and your knowledge, Paul. It's uh, always a valuable oh, in these always invaluable in these uncertain times when nobody really knows what's going on. So, thanks to everyone for tuning in. I'm glad you all found us this evening, and uh, I hope you'll uh, continue to listen because uh, got some pretty splendiferous music lined up for you as always. Um, going to be a great evening to chill out thank you jason and uh, thank you and i'd just like to say uh, to everybody don't be afraid to celebrate your victories because that's all i seem to be you know thinking don't be afraid to celebrate your victories it's a victory we've, we've won this one we wanted out we've got it okay absolutely that's a victory. it should be celebrated let's not look for 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 flaws that's it. Well, we've got we've got the music shows on late tonight. Um, as usual, eight o'clock on Sunday evening, we've got Windows on the World with Mark Windows, which I believe is a Brexit-centered show. And then on Tuesday, we've got something rather exciting. We've got Joanne Summerscales and Bill Brooks coming on to talk about their new book, Forty Four. So, uh, a bit of um, uh, ET contact there. So. Thanks, everyone, and uh, I'll pass you over to Tony. Good night. Good night.